Thank you very much. What a pleasure and a privilege to be back here in Baltimore and Shari Zion. And uh, um, I usually come at least once a year. And uh, I know when Or Samarik wanted to put this uh, program together, you know, they said uh, we haven't really done a program in Baltimore before. I said, well, I've done this lots of times. You know, I says, what do I do? Call Bloomy Weil. Tell her you're making a program, and she will handle everything. And uh, Orson Mack, when we won better, got her parents to go and sponsor refreshments. I never serve refreshments. I think that, uh, you know, um, I, uh, I, I just think that it is too Jewish to give refreshments in an event. I was speaking at the University of Pennsylvania, and I said about this, how every Jewish event, it says, refreshments will be served. You know, emergency committee meeting about the situation with Iran. Refreshments will be served, you know. And I was there in the University of Pennsylvania. I saw the board for the hill. I took it down. I brought it with me. And I said, come and study about the Holocaust, the destruction of our people. Refreshments will be served, you know. <laughs> so it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here in Baltimore. I thank you for that beautiful, beautiful introduction. Um, please, just not to destroy my career, I am just a comedian. And... Uh, <laughs> That's all I need. I had, I had one of my students come by and said, you know that shir by Rabbi Breitowitz? You said the same thing in your shir in Or Sameach. I said, shh. That's all I need is to be confused with a world-class scholar and, you know, academic who they decided to put me with, two, you know, professors and me. I'm that third son, the little Yutzlach, the one they all say, I don't know what we're going to do with, you know. So... Uh, you have the, the, the philosopher, and you have the uh, mathematician, you know, and the, and the lawyer, and, and you have me. But um, at least Rabbi Tass is in here. He's actually a doctor. You know, do me one better. But, um, but the truth is that this is a time of preparation, obviously. <clears throat> and it is so, of, so much of a problem that when there is so much preparation that we often lose focus what the purpose of the preparation is. And I don't want to minimize it. Because for everyone in this room, you, the preparation we're preparing for is a three-day yontif. That means you're going to be cooking meals and freezing them, and there's not going to be in a freezer space, and you're going to be borrowing other people's refrigerators, and you're going to try to fit everything in, and it's milkings and it's playshakes, and you have to get everything together. Okay, so we have a two-day yontif. You know, that's about all we Israelis can tolerate, you know. The fact is, most people don't know this, a three-day yontif was invented by the Chazal to encourage Aliyah. Not everybody knows this. <laughs> One of the main reasons I moved there. <laughs> so, I have to go through a three-day yontif, you know? So, uh, and I have eight daughters. You know what a three-day yontif does to your hair? Well, you know what it does to your hair, I don't think. I, Baruch Hashem, managed to keep mine, but... Uh, I mean that quite literally, I managed to keep mine. But... Um, you know, but the truth of the matter is, with all the cooking, with all the shopping, with all the preparing, with everything that goes into it, we lose our focus. And that's, that's, the, that's the pity. That's why this evening is such an incredibly dramatic event. And, I, and, and you don't appreciate this. I was in a taxi on my way to the airport in Israel. And those of you who've been to Israel know that taxi drivers are the, you know, the holders of all wisdom of the universe you know, in Israel. And this taxi driver says, you know, Lano to Nosea. I said, uh, Los Angeles. I started in Los Angeles. We did this in LA, we did this in Chicago, we did this in New York, we did this in Toronto, and finally, Baruch Hashem, I come to my town, Baltimore. And um, uh, these are my people. So anyway, so I, uh, thank you very much. You, you should applaud yourselves. But um, you deserve it. But, but uh, I didn't even get to my punchline. But uh, anyway, I'm in the, I'm in the, the cab. And he says to me, I said, Los Angeles. He says, Bishoma. I said, Yes, you're him. You know, he says, You're going to give a share before Shavuos and people are going to come? I said, Hundreds of people are going to come. He said, Ben Matt? I said, And they're going to pay for it. And he says to me, Amerikayim. <laughs> And my friends, do not minimize this. The fact that there are hundreds of people in this room tonight listening to different Rabbanim give insight into us for Shavuos is a tremendous testimony to the people who are in this room. And in that schus alone, everybody's going to be zaychut to remedis kabbal satayra the Shavuos. That's my own personal opinion. Thank you. So, uh, so that's, that's like I just, like I say, you know, this is something we take for granted. 
You know, you see a room full of people like this coming to listen to Shiurim. But it's because we know that we have to prepare. We know that it's a special time. I want to tell you a story. I'm not going to tell you what I said because that's really less important than maybe for another shir. And I don't like to use up all my material. But um, uh, I had a student in Dar Chibina, and she gives me a call, and I worked out the time difference, which is not always easy to do in Israel. You know, sometimes you call somebody, and it's really the middle of the night, because you went forward instead of backwards, and you should have been calling someone in Australia. But, uh, you know, I, I worked out the time difference pretty well, and I realized she's about to get married. It's like, this is her chasna. And I said, you're supposed to get married. And she's crying. She says, Rabbi Olavsky, you don't know what they're doing to me. So this is my wedding day. This is a day of such kedusha. All my sins get forgiven. It's my personal Yom Kippur. I'm trying to daven. They have someone doing my hair, someone doing my makeup, someone doing my nails, someone sewing me into a dress. You know what I mean? And all this stuff is going on and I'm trying to focus and I'm losing my focus. What I said is not important, at least not for now. But, but the fact that a person could have that, that sensibility... Now you walk into something without preparation. In old Yerushalayim, during the time of the Beis HaMikdash, you couldn't just walk into Yerushalayim. You had to stop, and you had to uh, clear your mind. There was a special section, special area, where you would stay to meditate before you walked into Yerushalayim. You didn't just walk into Yerushalayim. First time I went to Eretz uh, 1969, January 1969, a year and a half after the Six Day War. It was approximately 12, 15 years before I was born. And um, <laughs> if I work up my biography. But anyway, <laughs> if you want to follow the whole story. But anyway, so um, uh, we were on this tour bus, and it was not a religious tour. And, um, and it was this torturous winding Babel Wad. It's not like it is today. You know, we actually have a highway. It was this like two-lane road. And as we're approaching Yerushalayim, the bus driver, you know, pulls over to the side of the road and the tour guide, not a religious man, says, you don't ride into Yerushalayim, you walk. And he made us all get off the bus and we walked into Yerushalayim till I saw that little floral arrangement they used to have there, Bruchem Abayim Yerushalayim. And I was a kid, it made such an impression on me. To this day, whenever I come to Yerushalayim, those words echo in my mind. You don't ride into Yerushalayim, you walk into Yerushalayim. There's a certain preparation that you need. Okay, so you have people who are going to the Kaisal for the first time, and they've never been to the Western Wall. And in their mind, you know, we, we tend to build everything up in our mind, in a Hollywood experience, you know what I mean? And we think we're going to approach the wall, and the clouds will part, and a ray of light will shine upon us, and the angels will begin to sing, ah! and I'll touch the wall, and I'll connect with thousands of years of Jewish history, and the tears will begin to flow, or no, because it's just a wall, it's an old wall, but, you know, I gave you money already, get out of here, you know? I wonder what this guy wants, you know? <laughs> I think it's in French. Anyway, you know. You know and it's like, what happened? Because you didn't prepare yourself. Without proper preparation, you walk in, you think it's going to happen. It's a poof. You walk in on, on Rosh Hashanah, they're going to blow the chauffeur. You know, uh, if, if our mindset hasn't been prepared, if we haven't worked for it, it's going to be a meaningless experience. You have to put in the preparation. You have to work at it. It's a sad reality, but we all know it. I, uh, um, somebody told me that, uh, that there are many social problems that exist in the Jewish people today. And uh, all of them have existed at some point, in some level. There's a new phenomenon. You know, there's only one problem that's really a new phenomenon. You know, young couples who get divorced within the first two years of marriage. This is, this is a magefa in Klai Yisrael, you know? And why it is, there's all kinds of discussions, all kinds of reasons, but there's one, there's one you know, uh, pundit who says, I'll tell you why, because we spend more time planning the wedding than we do planning the marriage. You know? And, and the, the, everyone knows this. You know? A couple cannot get married today unless they have an official logo. I don't know where this is written, but it's a rule. They have to make a logo, and they're sure that everyone gets the invitation and are studying the logo. You know, because they sit down and they say to you, you see, he's Eliezer and I'm Rivka and this is a well, you see, and you can see, oh, I see. And there's an olive, you see the handle, oh, that's unbelievable, you know what I mean? I'll let you know a little secret, you know, basically what happens is it comes and you say, who is this, you know? So, oh, there's a wedding, okay, when you write it down, you stick it in the drawer. If I had my wedding to do over again, I would just make a flyer. Come to a wedding, where, when, how much, you know? 
We put so much time and so much emphasis into all the preparations, but what about life itself? What about the marriage itself? You know? This is so true. We see it in so many ways that people let the most important things slip out of their hands. So Shavuos is only days away, and make no mistake about it. All of Shavuos is about preparation. The name of the holiday is Shavuos. It's, it's weeks, weeks of preparation. In the Torah, it's called Yom HaMishim, is, is very bright it was mentioned. It's the 50th day. The Christians call it Pentecost, right? Penta being 50, cost being it costs a lot of money because you have three of them. Imagine, I'm not sure exactly, but I'm a little, a little rusty on my Latin, but um, <laughs> I'm the only non-intellectual on the Rasta. But anyway, but, um, you know, but uh, it's the 50th day, Yom HaMishim. We don't call it that. It's the weeks of preparation leading up to it that makes Shavuos a meaningful experience. So now we're in the last days, literally the final days before Shavuos. Days left. And we have to get ourselves ready for it. How do we prepare ourselves? Now, there's a lot of different things. And uh, the Rabbanu who went before me dealt with two particular aspects of it. I want to deal with a different aspect of it. And I'm telling you that the three of us could come back here next year and come up with three completely different shurim because there's so much to say about Shavuos. Matan Torah, the time when we're going to hit the Torah, it's such an important holiday. And it's so interesting, Rabbi Shiloh, when he was speaking in New York, he says, the first holiday that disappears, you know, when a Jew begins to lose it is Shavuos. You know, he'll hold on to Pesach for a long time, but Shavuos, which is the most essential, is the first one that tends to drift away. So I want to share with you uh, Gemara in Shabbos on day, Daf Peches. And it's explaining a posik in Matan Torah, the Yisiyatsvu B'Tachti Sahar. They stood, it's usually translated, at the foot of the mountain, at the foothills of the mountain, at the base of the mountain, Tachti Sahar, at the bottom of the mountain. Says the Gemara, what does it mean, Tachti Sahar? Omer Rav Abdimi Bar Chama Bar Chasa, Melamed Shekafu HaKadosh Baruch Hu Aleim Es Hahar Kigigas. They held the mountain over their head like a barrel. Ve'or Melehem Im Atem Mekablum HaToyre Mutav. If you accept the Torah, good. Ve'im lav. If not, shum tiyak furascham. There will be your grave. I assumed when I saw the title for the entire Yom Yun, an offer you can't refuse, I assumed they were referring to this Gemara. As the actual line goes, either your signature or your brains are going to be on that paper. You understand? If you know what the reference is, you can admit it. And uh, <laughs> it's like I knew this Bacha who was going to a lot, Yeshiva Bacha, we're not supposed to go to a lot. I said, Aren't you going to be afraid someone will see you? He goes, No, because then he'll have to explain what he was doing there. <laughs> I once spoke at an Amin conference. I just made the bracha. I said, well, my work here is done. Anyway. <laughs> Held the mountain over their head like, uh, like a barrel and said, if you accept the Torah, good. And if not, there will be your grave. Yeah. Now people have an excuse not to keep the Torah. I was forced to put a gun to my head. I was under coercion. How can, I, how can you expect me to keep the Torah now? You, you, you did it by force. And the Gemara's answer is, surprisingly, you're right. It doesn't deny the underlying premise. Omar Rabba, Afal Pekin, even so, even though you're right that we have an excuse to say that we didn't keep the Torah because we were forced, Hodu Kibluhu Biyamei We re-accepted the Torah willingly in the time of Achashverosh in the Purim story. Dechsev, Kimo Vekiblu Yehudim. The Jews established and received. They established what they had already received. And this is the Gemara, which is pretty well known. Rashi accesses it is in uh, the Pesach on the Torah. Thank you. I didn't really need the cup. I need the cup, so. As you will see in a minute. I have four questions on this Gemara. The first question is an obvious question that a number of the Mepharshim ask. What did the people say? The people said, you know, um, uh, Kodesh Baruch Hu said, if you accept the Torah, good. If not, this will be your grave. I'm going to hold the mountain over your head. 
They already said Nasim and Ishma, is what we got, they've explained so well. They already said Nasim and Ishma. They said, we will do whatever you say. Could you imagine? Could you do me a favor? It would be my pleasure, anything. You better, or I'm going to blow you away. Good thing I said yes. Imagine if I said no. <laughs> what are you threatening me for? I already said yes. Nasim and Ishma, we'll do anything you say. Then you threaten me? That's question number one. Question number two is, he held the mountain over their head like a barrel. That, to me, does not sound terribly effective. I would have held the mountain over their head like a mountain. Yeah. <laughs> or like a rock. <laughs> you held the mountain over my head like a barrel? That's not very effective, as we will illustrate. <clears throat> when you drop a barrel, look what happens. Nothing. Everybody see that in the back? Can you really see through that thing? Okay, anyway, right? It doesn't do anything. Na, 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 na. Why would you hold the man over the head like a barrel? Hold the man over the head like a mountain? Question number two. Question number three is a picky question. I admit this up front. I don't apologize for it because I learned in Yeshiva Chavetz Chaim. Thank you. Those of you who learned in Yeshiva Chavetz Chaim will immediately appreciate this. Those of you who didn't, I will attempt to illustrate what that means. We go very slow. I mean ridiculously slow. The, re- uh, the reason the Gemara starts on Daf Beis instead of Daf Aleph is so that the Chavetz Chaim guys will feel like they're making progress. You know what I mean? <laughs> Look, we're already on Beis. <laughs> the first word of every Gemara is in a box. This is so the Chavetz Chaim guys can monitor their progress. <laughs> the year before I started in Yeshiva, Rabbi Chait actually spent an entire Elzman, that's five weeks, on the first ha of the first word. He didn't get out of the box. He was on the first letter of the first word for five weeks. So we have a tendency to go very slow, you know? Different people from different yeshivas, you can fill in whatever yeshivas work for you. They get up to Shemayim, they say, what did you accomplish in your lifetime? He says, I learned a thousand pages of Gemara, I learned uh, five thousand pages, I learned ten thousand pages. Chavetz Chaim guy says, what do you mean? I don't understand, what do you mean accomplish? Define the term. I don't understand. So what did you accomplish in your life? I don't, I don't understand the question. I don't know. What do you mean? What do you mean accomplish? I mean, define terms. I don't know what you're talking about, you know. He says, well, how much did you learn? So what do you mean by learn? Like, really know? I mean, learn? What do you mean? Turn the pages? Read it? What are you, what are you talking about? He says, okay, I'll make this easy. Just say over a piece of Torah. He said, no, no, we don't work that way. You say over a piece of Torah, and we'll show you why you're wrong. You understand? <laughs> And that's how we are. We, we, it was very, very picky. Most people were not aware of this, but the Gemara begins on Daf Beis, not on Daf Aleph. And that's to give Chavetz Chaim guys the illusion that they've covered ground. <laughs> the first word of every Gemara is in a box. This is so that Chavetz Chaim guys can track their progress. Life imitates art. You know, it's, it sounds like it's a joke, but the truth of the matter is that uh, when I was in yeshiva, they told me that last year, Elozman, which was five weeks, they spent on the first letter of the first word, it was ha. They spent an entire Elozman on ha, so they didn't even get out of the box. You know what I mean? And they come back, Sukhizman, they come out of the box. So we go very picky and very slow. So you could argue it's a picky and question, and I'll say, what do you mean? But in any event, so... Um, uh, it says, if you accept the Torah, good. Ve'imlav, sham tiek furoscham. There will be your grave. It should have said, po tiek furoscham. Here will be your grave. So, I don't understand what the, what the connection is. Why would you say there? So someone said to me, well, God's speaking. He's up there. He's down there. No, it doesn't work that way. It says God came down to the mountain. So he was right down there. Yeah? So, uh, so how do you explain this? And the fourth question, which again is an obvious question, is what happened in the Purim story that somehow changed everybody's attitude from what took place at Mount Sinai when God held the mountain over their head? So those are the questions. Yeah? They already said Nasev and Ishma that we will accept it. Uh, why hold the, it over their head like a barrel? Why uh, does it say, there will be your grave? And what happened in the Purim story that changed their attitude? Right? Those are the four questions. I'm going to answer the first question and then introduce a completely different set of problems. Uh, the idea being that if you ask enough questions, people don't remember what you were saying. And um, 
That's why Rabbi was very careful. He kept reviewing what each question was. I don't know if you followed that, because, you know, he, uh, he's a lawyer. I'm a rabbi. But um, he can actually make a living if he wanted to. I have no choice. I have to be here. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know how to do anything else. But um, so uh, the, um, well, there it goes. I have to stop at the beginning. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So, um, so the Tanhuma, the Medrash Tanhuma answers the first question. It says, yes, they said, Nasif and Ishma, we will accept everything, but they were only referring to the written Torah and not to the oral Torah. The written Torah is, of course, the actual text. The oral Torah is the rabbinic tradition, which there have been movements throughout history which have rejected the Karaites, the Sadducees, etc. And they said, we don't want to accept an oral Torah, but we will interpret it as we understand. That's the way that they answer that first question. They were willing to accept, and that's what God had to threaten them to accept. Now, before we go any further, I want to bring in a Gemara in Bacharos, a very strange Gemara. It's a, a unusual Gemara. Those of you who have studied Greek philosophy, so you know there's what's called a Socratic dialogue. A Socratic dialogue means that Socrates, who had much too much time on his hand, would sit in the streets of Athens and bother people. And he'd say, excuse me, sir, what do you do? He says, I'm a shoemaker. Well, would you grant me that a shoemaker is such and such? And the person would argue for a little bit. And after a while, he's reduced to saying, oh, yes, O oh, Socrates. Oh, no, O oh, Socrates. How wise, O oh, Socrates. And then he'd stop the next person. You're a poet. Wouldn't you agree a poet is this and that? And they would argue a little bit. And then they'd say, oh, yes, O oh, Socrates. No, Socrates. This went on until people got so sick of it, they made him kill himself. But um, I'm giving you a brief overview of philosophical uh, history. But um, that's how the Greeks would more or less argue. They would set up a straw man, and then they would bounce their arguments over it. If you studied Gemara, studied the Talmud, it's dramatically different. It's fight to the death. Beat the guy down. You are wrong. You want to reach the end where you can have a line like, Tiyufta de Rabbi Yechran Tiyufta. Rabbi Yechran is wrong. What? Wrong. Say it again. Wrong. Say it. Wrong. You know? Beat him down. Boom. You know? Say it again. Wrong. You know? And that's what it is. It's amazing when you walk into a base medrash and see people learning, you can at times not really appreciate that these are people who are working together. Because you see people arguing and yelling and insulting each other and carrying on and, and then like, want to go for a coffee? Yeah, okay. And they go out for a coffee and come back and, you don't know anything, that's not shot no tasteless, you don't know how to learn, you know. The yelling is screaming because the goal is to arrive at the truth and not just to be nice. Open parentheses. Right? It says that during this period of time, the students of Rabbi Akiva died because they weren't showing covered to each other. They weren't showing honor to each other. What do they mean they weren't showing honor? You think they weren't being nice to each other? Of course they were. They were being too nice. Because if you really respect somebody, then you argue with them. A person you don't respect, you humor them. So when somebody says something that you don't really respect, you go, oh yeah, oh, that's interesting. I know my wife says this to me a lot, but um, <laughs> my kids have managed to do that just by rolling their eyes. They don't even have to open their mouth, you know. But, um, but somebody who you really respect, you say, well, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense, you know. And you start to argue with them and you argue with them until either I'm right or you're right because that's the way that we engage you know, so the Gemara is not there to be nice and be polite and to respect everybody's opinion. Either I'm right and you're wrong, or you're right and I'm wrong, and I'll admit it. But let's, let's work this out. Let's come to a conclusion, right? So we're going to argue it through. So um, the uh, king forced Rabbi Yeshua to argue and debate the Chachmei Atuna, the wise men of Athens. And the Gemara tells us the wise men of Athens did everything they could to avoid this debate. They hid, they this, they had guards. They, okay, Rabbi Yeshua managed to outsmart them all and finally confronts them and says, okay, my friends, we, the king is forcing us to have a debate to the death. If I win, you guys get put to death, and if you win, I get put to death. Okay, so let's have this debate. And they say, okay, we'll have this debate, however... The debate is only going to be in riddles. Now, this is something that has happened throughout Jewish history. Uh, the most famous example is, of course, the Ramban and Pablo Cristiani. 
uh, who had a debate about Judaism and with Judaism versus Christianity, and um, that was one of the few times that we got them to drop all the rules and we could have a fair debate. Other times, it was, you know, they would control what we could say, how you could argue, what you were allowed to say, what you were allowed to do, and it, it became very difficult. And it was it was more or less fixed before you even start that we were going to lose. You know, it was one famous story in this particular village where the priest and the rabbi were going to have this debate and the king was overseeing it and if the Jews lost they would all be forced to be baptized and if the um, and if the priest somehow managed to lose so then he would uh, you know have to um, uh, sign that the Jews would remain unmolested and it would take away all the special taxes and you know okay the Jews had no choice. There was a big stage set up, and the priest gets up, and the rabbi gets up, and the king is the judge, and the entire town is gathered around. And the priest announces, but this debate will be done only in pantomime. No words will be spoken. What are you going to do? Okay. So the priest looks at the rabbi, and he's quite confident because he's prepared for this. The rabbi didn't know what was going to happen. And the priest goes like this. Without hesitating, the rabbi goes... The priest is shocked. He, he certainly didn't expect the rabbi to respond, certainly not so quickly, and certainly not right to the point. <laughs> so the priest gathers together his strength, and he goes like this. And once again, without even hesitating, the rabbi goes like this. The priest begins to sweat. He paces up and down the stage. He goes... Finally, he knows what to do. When he goes down and he lifts up a bottle of wine and a loaf of bread, and the rabbi nods knowingly and reaches into his pocket and pulls out an apple. And at that point, the priest just breaks down and he says, I don't know what to do. The man is too smart. He counters everything I come up with. I give up. And the king says, well, I guess the debate's over. Um, he signs the document. And everyone goes home till it's just the king and the priest. And the king says, look, I may not be the brightest penny in the pile, but I couldn't follow what was going on there. He says, didn't you follow that? He goes, no. I said to him, you Jews think you're the chosen people. God is up in heaven. And he says, no, God is right here with us. I said, God is three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he said, hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And then I brought out the wine and the bread, showing him that only by communion with the blood and the flesh of the Savior can you possibly be saved. And he said, that's because you Christians believe in the original sin of Adam with the, Adam, with the apple. But we Jews believe that all people can get close to God. He says, I had no idea this rabbi was so smart. He goes, I, if I knew, I never would have agreed to this debate. So they get back to the shul for Mincha. And they say, so uh, Rabbi, what was that all about? He says, I'll tell you the truth, I have no idea. <laughs> he says, but what was that whole debate? He goes, I don't know. He said, you Jews, get out of here. I said, we're staying right here. <laughs> he says, then I'll slap you in the face. I said, you do it, I'll poke you in the eye. <laughs> and then he took out his lunch, and I took out my lunch, and it was over. <laughs> I give this entire shear just for that joke. You should know. <laughs> like when we Tats tells the story with, you know, the targets, you know. I had this joke. I said, how can I build a shear around this joke? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I guess I have to finish the shear anyway. But anyway. So, uh, so here, he's going to debate the wise men of Athens, and it's only in riddles. So here's, the, here's one of the riddles. You ready? <clears throat> the wise men of Athens say to Rabbi Yeshua, how do you preserve salt? Preserve salt? Salt's a preservative. What kind of stupid question is that? <laughs> and Yeshua says, with the placenta of a mule. The wise men of Athens say, a mule doesn't have a placenta. And if Yeshua says, and salt doesn't spoil. I believe that answers all of our questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> As one of my seminary girls would say, what? That's so random. <laughs> I've learned how to speak woman. <laughs> I teach in a seminary. I have eight daughters. I had no choice. I had to, I had to, I actually, I got a book. It was called Men are from Mars, Women are from Venus. 
This is written by John Gray, who's much more of an expert on marriage than I am. I've only been married once. He's been married four times. So, um... <laughs> That's the second reason I give this year. But anyway, <laughs> but in any event, the, uh, uh, it's a very strange discussion. What's the discussion? The discussion is something that continues right down to this day and has gone through all of history. Rabbi, you Jews are a very impressive people. You've been around for about 1,200 years. That's certainly impressive. How many civilizations have lasted 1,200 years? You know, intact. That's really very impressive. But let's face it. Hellenism is sweeping the world. You guys are old hat. You're losing your youth. It's time to get Greek, Rabbi. You know, you gotta, you gotta get it with modern times. You know, it's almost 200 BCE. You know? Put on a toga. Throw a discus. Watch a tragedy. You know what I mean? Something. You gotta put yourself together. Your salt is starting to spoil. He says, oh, I can preserve the salt with the placenta of a mule. How do you get a mule? You have a horse and you have a donkey. And a her horse has certain milers and advantages and a donkey has certain horses, uh, has certain <laughs> advantages and certain milers. When you put them both together, yeah, you get a mule. And a mule has advantages over a horse and over a donkey. Yeah? Um, and it's tremendous. It's a great thing. It has one serious drawback. It's sterile. It will never reproduce. Of course you'll never get a placenta from a mule because salt doesn't spoil. Yeah, I could make something that'll be more popular than traditional Judaism and it'll last one generation. And there's no way for me to be able to keep this going. Yeah, right now, Hellenism is the rage. But give it time. Real Torah doesn't vanish. Real values don't change. This was the message that he tried to tell us. Now we go back to our Gemara. The Jews said, Nasiv and Ishma will accept the written Torah but we don't want to accept the oral Torah. We don't want to listen to the rabbis. We don't want to follow their interpretation. We'll figure it out for ourselves. So God held the mountain over their head like a barrel, not like a rock. He wasn't going to kill them. Like a barrel. What do you use a barrel for? Preserving things. Give it a more modern uh, read. A glass jar. And he held a glass jar over their head and said, if you want to accept the oral law, fine. And if not, shum t'yekros, I'm not here, I'm not going to kill you. There will be a grave. Whenever your generation dies out, you are finished. And I'm going to put a little glass jar over you and we'll put you in a museum and we'll say there were this freaky people who lived in the desert for 40 years but they couldn't pass it on to their children because they interpreted the Torah in a way that made sense to them while they were living in the desert. And then they moved into the land of Israel and they became farmers and they said, come on, Dad, we got to go plow, plow. You know, when I was in the desert, the mun used to fall from the sky. I know, Dad, but there's no mun anymore and we're fine. we got to go dig the well. Well, you know, we had a rock that used to roll along with us and give us what I uh, We have no rocks, we have no wells, we got to dig. Farmers stand, uh, uh, come on, let's go. You know, you, your religion doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, so we'll make up something that makes sense for an agricultural community when we're living in our own land. What happens when the temple's destroyed and we go into exile? What happens now? <coughs> so now you don't know what to do. So I'll make up a different one. I'll make up something else that makes sense to me for the here and now. And it'll be very popular for a generation. And that story was the Purim story because the Jews are now living in exile. And the leader was this old Jew, Mordechai Yehudi, Mordechai the Jew. And Ahasuerus was making a big party, and they said everybody has to come to the party. And Mordechai says, don't go to the party. It's Mamish also, I'm telling you not to go. <laughs> and they say, Mordechai, Reb Mordechai, Reb Yid, you're from the Altaheim. Uh, by the way, throughout history, all Jews have spoken Yiddish. I don't know why people think it's a Germanic language. It goes back. Moshe was actually known as Moshe Rabbeini. Most people don't know this. Yeah. <laughs> they said, Rabid, 
You're from the old country. These are modern times. You don't understand. We need you, Rabbi, you know, to tell us if the chicken's kosher and things like that. We need you to, you know, cut the challah at the bar mitzvah. But for the most part, why don't you just stay there with your holy books and we will figure out the best way to handle things. And so they go to the party. And up in Shemayim, that sealed their fate. That was a terrible sin. So now Haman comes to compound it. He's wearing idols all around him. And he tells everyone to bow down. And everybody says, well, we're not really bowing down to the idols. We're bowing down to Haman. And it's a sign of respect to the king. And it's a political necessity. And Mordechai won't bow. And they say, Mordechai, what are you doing? You're going to get him upset. We're going to get us into trouble. And he says, you don't bow by Avodah Zerah. You don't do this. And he says, Mordechai, you and your crazy chumrits, you're going to get us all killed. Just bow down like everybody else. No, I'm not going to do it. And sure enough, comes out Haman and he says, because of Mordechai, I'm going to kill all of you Jews. And they say, look, Mordechai, now we're all going to get killed. What should we do now? He says, now do tshuva. And they say, oh, we'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll try to get Esther. Esther's in the palace. We know she's really a Jew. We'll get her to help us, you know? Oh, Esther decided instead to cozy up to Haman and Ahasuerus, invite them to special parties and stuff. Oh my gosh, we're stuck. Well, what do we do? Where do we go? What do we turn? And they come back to Mordechai and say, we're stuck. He says, listen to me and do tshuva. This is what we're supposed to do. And against their better judgment, they start doing tshuva. And what happens? Haman puts up a giant gallows and says, tomorrow I'm going to hang Mordechai on those gallows. So, boy, we're finished. And the next day they go out and they look at the gallows and sure enough, there's Mordechai hanging from the gallows. Wait a second. Mordechai doesn't wear that funny hat. That looks like Haman. Where's Mordechai? Oh, there he is in the royal robes. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Good to see you, you know? Wait a second. That's not the way the story's supposed to go. You're supposed to be hung. We're supposed to get killed. Oh, you know something? Maybe those old rabbis know something after all. Kimu v'kiblu. They understood that there is something that history has taught us, and that is that the fidelity we've had to the Torah, that we followed the traditional Torah over the years, we've stuck around against everyone's better judgment. Every time we make changes, and they seem like great changes, and they seem like they make a lot of sense, boom. You have a real popular movement, the Karaites. At one point, the Karaites were the major force in Judaism. A major force. You know, the, the, the Ga'onim, the Rishonim, they had to work hard to counter their arguments and their movements. The, the, the Baal Ma'or writes that anybody who does not eat Cholent on Shabbos is suspect and cannot be considered a Jew. I don't want to tell you what happens if you do eat it, but that's if you don't eat it. <laughs> so what was he talking about? He didn't mean Cholent, he meant hot food. Because the Karaites wouldn't heat up food on Shabbos. You know, so they would, uh, they, they would, they would follow things and, and, it was, and they were very popular. Now you can go days without meeting a Karaite. You know what I mean? How often do you bump into a Karaite, you know? <clears throat> and so I, I told this over in Los Angeles, someone said, oh, I met a guy, he was a Karaite. You know, you know? What make, makes the story interesting is you found one, you know what I mean? But they're not like a major force anymore. Bit by bit things start to change. Because salt doesn't spoil. It might not be so popular, but it doesn't spoil. So, I want to share with you a personal thought, and uh, I guess I'll give a, an introduction. I was doing a question and answer once, and somebody said, how come we say Yisker on the Shal Shregolem? Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot. How come we say Yisker? Remember the dead. We, we, we do this really on Yom Kippur. Why do we do it now? So I said, I think there's a special reason why. <coughs> There's something about the holidays that reminds us of the people who went before us. You know, you sit at a Seder and you might have people who are not particularly observant in other areas of their lives, but when it comes to that Seder, I'm doing it like my grandfather did it. You know, my father always used this kind of charoses. I don't want this kind of charoses. It's got to be like my father. He, my, my, my grandfather always did it like this. This is the way we do it. This is our traditions. And it reminds you of the traditions. When you come around to a holiday, it reminds you of, of where you come from. My grandfather came from Poland, uh, a town called Vengrov. If you ever have the opportunity to miss it, uh, take advantage. It's, um, <laughs> it's really not that exciting a, a town. And uh, my, uh, my grandfather moved to America to, you know, to, make, a, to make a living. And uh, he, he went over, he got enough money to bring across my grandmother and my aunt. 
And my father was born in Brownsville in Brooklyn, which was a Jewish slum in the old days. And, um, and my grandfather was, I would say, an observant Jew, much the way the Chavetz Chaim describes the town of Rodden. He says, you know why all the Jews in Rodden keep Shabbos? Because all the Jews in Rodden keep Shabbos. And my grandfather didn't know too much, and nobody back then knew too much. You know, you came to, you know, you came to America, and you, you tried to make a living, and you remembered whatever you remembered. There wasn't rabbinical leadership to, to speak of. And uh, my father grew up with no Jewish education. He told me, I used to go into the little shtibel where the old men were saying uh, psalms, saying to Hillam, and I'd ask him, why? Why do we this, and why do we that? And they'd say, you don't ask. There's no, no question, you don't ask. My father said, that's not good enough. He's right. But there was no worse than back then. There was no place you could go and get answers. There was no place where you could get an education. So, um, so my father uh, went into the flower business, moved out to the suburbs, married a nice Jewish girl um, who came from the better side of town. My, my mother's father had started the Green Line Bus Company in Queens, uh, started with one bus and built it into a major corporation and then he died young and his brothers squeezed my grandmother out of the company and I lost my bus company um, my life could have been so different <laughs> instead of a rabbi I could have been a balabas but um, <laughs> that's the third reason I give this year but anyway <laughs> it's a true story but anyway <coughs> so they got married they moved out to the suburbs they had six boys of whom I'm the quietest. And, um, and that's it. And they were living a basically Jewish life in America on the road to assimilation. We went to a conservative synagogue basically on the high holidays. My brothers went to Hebrew school there till their bar mitzvah. We all had our bar mitzvah there, you know. And uh, that was more or less where our family was headed. Um, it was interesting that in the 1970s they did a study of a hundred kids in a conservative synagogue and they found three will become orthodox, 17 will become reform, 30 will remain conservative, 50 will disaffiliate. And uh, that was my generation. That's why I was growing up. But at the time, it was clear that this was the wave of the future. Every synagogue was not orthodox. All the orthodox were just old people living in the slums, East New York, you know, the Bronx, uh, the Low East Side. Everything was... You know, that was it. It was over. This is the wave of the future, you know? And uh, that's where we were going. That was, that was our path, more or less. I had a brother who's a genius. Every Jewish boy is a genius, you know? He went to Brandeis on a full scholarship, graduated first in his class. He went to Duke Law School, graduated first in his class. Uh, they give out seven special awards. He won five of them. They offered him a clerkship in the Supreme Court. He had a fellowship in Yale. He was a bright boy. And... Um, when he was in sixth grade, he got into a fight with one of his teachers about Constantine, which I know is an emotional issue for <laughs> most elementary school children. And he challenged it to a debate, and like a fool, she accepted. And my brother wiped the floor with her, and they, they don't know what to do with this, so they call in my father, and they say, listen, you have to send him to a private school. Now, my father grew up in Brownsville. He didn't have an education past, you know, junior high school, because he had to go out and work in the Depression, you know. He didn't know from a private school. That meant the yeshiva. So the Hebrew Academy of Nassau County had just started, and he um, signed him up, and they, uh, uh, my brother went there. He was starting seventh grade, and he convinced my father to send the three younger children. I was starting in first grade at the time, my brother in second grade, my other brother in nursery. And, uh, and my mother, when she told me of the story, said this was a very hard decision for us because your father had gone bankrupt several years earlier. I said, when? She says, right around when you were born. <laughs> Every child brings their own luck, she said. <laughs> I said, so then how'd you pay for it? I didn't buy a new dress, we didn't go on vacation, you know, we, we cut corners and we did whatever we could do to get a scholarship. He says, and you know, it killed your father to take a scholarship. My father went bankrupt, but he paid back every single person he owed money to. And I heard from the dean of the school, years later, he says, my father came in and paid back every penny of scholarship money that he had taken over the years, you know, because th that's the way my father was. So, um, uh, you know, I, we, we went into yeshiva, and, um, and one by one, you know, we 
became Torah observant Jews. And uh, then my other two brothers who didn't go, they became Torah observant Jews. Eventually my father, you know, got on board, you know. And, uh, and, and I take a look around today on my family tree. And you can find whole branches where there's almost nobody left who's Jewish. And this one's gone out, and this one's gone out. And the, what was the difference? The difference was that after World War II, some of those old rabbis, that Mordechai Yehudi, came to America, and they looked at a population where Torah was dead. And they said, what should we work on? Shabbos, Kashas, what do we work on? And they said, there's only one thing that keeps the Jewish people alive, and that's Torah. Build Jewish day schools. And I said, Jewish day schools? Who's going to send a kid to a Jewish day school? You know, the public schools were great back then, you know, and everybody wanted to be an American. And who had money for this? Who wanted this? I heard from Rabbi Greenblatt, who founded the day school in Memphis. He told me, he says, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein had 30 students. And he told all of them, you all have to go out and open up day schools around America. <clears throat> so I came to Rabbi Moshe, I said, I don't speak English. He says, I don't speak English either, and I've done all right for myself. You know, go ahead. So I went down to Memphis, I opened a, a day school. He says, the other 29 closed, mine was the only one that was successful, you know, without my English, you know. <clears throat> and he says, and we went out there to build schools. And we came in, we were nice kids from, you know, from backgrounds that were not Shomer Shabbos, and we came into a school, and, uh, and bit by bit, we managed to find that salt that doesn't spoil. And everything else that was built, everything else that we thought was going to be forever, it was just a mule. It didn't, it didn't reproduce. And when you take a look around today, to think that there was a time that we thought that Torah would not be able to survive in America, and now you see the, the strength of the, of the Torah community, it's all for only one reason. Because salt doesn't spoil. Because there's these words, there are these books, that when a person attaches themselves to it, it becomes real. You begin to understand where I come from and what it's all about. We're going to go in on Shruis and we're going to, God's going to say to us, do you want the Torah? And you have to be honest with yourself. Do I want the Torah? Or do I want parts of it? Or do I want a little bit of it? Do I want to say Nasev and Ishma? Do I want to take the whole package? Do I want to assume that God knows what he's doing? I was going through a hard time a couple of years ago. I had a Hasidish friend. So he sees me. He says, Reb Levi Yitzchak Pidichif was walking with his Hasidim and he stops. And he says, If I was God, you know what I would do? And everyone says, What? And he says, Just what he's doing now. Why, you think I'm smarter than him? <laughs> and I thought, Yeah, yeah, I think I'm smarter than him. I look at a situation, I say, God, you dropped the ball on this one. I could have sure handled this better. But the truth of the matter is, the Jews are around for a very long time, often in spite of our own best efforts. You know, and a Kurdish Baruch who knows what he's doing. There's a book and there's, is, that we've received with a written law and an oral law. The more we prepare ourselves to be able to accept it, when it comes down, we'll get it. There's going to be an outpouring of Torah. And we will accept as much as we're willing to take. And the more that we get, the more we guarantee that there's a survival of the Jewish people for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren. You know, when you think about what we got and we think about what we have to give over, <clears throat> my father gave me his grandfather's Megillah. I don't know how old it is. I had to have it fixed. It was worn out to the point there were holes in it. We had to have it fixed up. My father, his name was Moshe Yehuda. His grandfather was Moshe Yehuda. I sit in shul on Purim with my son, Moshe Yehuda. And I look at the Megillah that my father, Moshe Yehuda, gave me from his grandfather, Moshe Yehuda. And we look inside of those same words. And we read that same story of a Mordechai Yehudi who said that salt doesn't spoil. Real Torah continues. The more we attach ourselves, study after study shows that it's the people who are most learned who maintain their Jewish identity the best. 
They're the ones who hold on to the most. There are many organizations here. And I have to tell you, one of the things about Or Sameach is that Baruch Hashem, we not only have do a lot of great work ourselves, we inspire and, and manage to help build many other Torah organizations. And the people who are here this evening are here, as I said at the beginning, there's this special power because of all the Torah greats perhaps who've lived here over the years that people are willing to come out for an evening for hours listening to the rabbis tell us how we can get ready to go into the holiday of Shavuos to be able to maximize our Jewish experience, to be able to get the most out of it, to be able to reconnect to that salt. My friends, this is a tremendous testimony to yourselves. It's a tremendous testimony to the power of Or Sameach, the power of Torah, the power of these many wonderful Torah organizations. My friends, together we can go and rebuild the Jewish people the way it's supposed to be. Thank you very much.